Hey everyone, so I'm, uh, I'm Jacob and I work at Ambiata. I'm going to be talking about property testing and shrinking. So uh, how many people have used QuickCheck or some sort of property testing library? And uh, how many people here invented QuickCheck? <laughs> Just one. <yeah. laughs> I absolutely love QuickCheck, John. Thank you, thank you for inventing it. It's absolutely transformed the way that I go about writing robust software and I just wouldn't be able to do my job without it. And one of my favorite things about QuickCheck is uh, shrinking. Now, what is shrinking? We heard a little bit about it in the, the keynote and I'm gonna show you a, a classic sort of QuickCheck shrinking example right now. So here we've got a, a property. We want to check that if we concatenate two lists and reverse that, that should be the same as reversing x's and then adding that to the reverse of y's. Now that's obviously not true. Um, so we would expect to get some sort of failure. And if you put this into quick check, it'll give you some sort of counterexample. Well, it won't give you this counterexample because this is a little bit large and hard to understand. So uh, what it would do instead is shrink this counterexample to a minimal one. So if we substitute that into our, into our equation, then we'll see that this is obviously not true because if we reverse a singleton list with zero and re reverse a singleton list one, um, that's just gonna give us zero and one when we add them together. And the, uh, the one at the top will give you one and zero. So that's obviously not true. Now, there's a few different ways that you could go about implementing this shrinking. The first of which I'm gonna call type directed shrinking. So that's used by the Haskell version of QuickCheck um, and its derivatives. So uh, property testing libraries like FSCheck for F sharp, uh, Scala check, Scala props, the Rust version of QuickCheck, I'm sure there's, there's like many, many more. Uh, it's usually sort of uh, statically typed languages that do it this way. So what do I mean by type directed shrinking? If we look at this property in uh, the Haskell version of QuickCheck, you'll see that we have, um, we somehow get, get the values for x's and y's kind of magically out of the air. So it's, it's the types that are uh, directing the input generation and they also control how shrinking works. So how does this work? Well, in Haskell, there's an arbitrary type class which you can implement some instances for. So there's an instance for integer <coughs> and there's an instance for list. And, uh, it's interesting to note, and maybe we'll come back to it later, that the default shrink is just returning an empty list. Um, and it's sort of interesting, I think, that this approach is also taken in, uh, in languages that don't necessarily have any kind of implicit resolution infrastructure, and they just simulate it with dependency injection or something like that. So it's interesting to note. So that's type-directed shrinking. The other... Um, the way that you can do shrinking is what I'll, I'm going to call integrated shrinking. So Cubix Erlang QuickCheck uh, is, uh, uses what I would call integrated shrinking, test.check in Clojure. Uh, there's a library in Python called Hypothesis, which does it this way. And I recently found out that Elm test fuzzers also use integrated shrinking. It seems to be popular with languages that are uh, unityped, like dynamic languages, and uh, also languages that don't have any kind of implicit resolution. <coughs> so here's what the example looks like in Erlang. Um, you can see here that we're building up the generator and the shrinker using combinators. So here we've got list and we want to generate an int. And so somehow the shrinking capabilities need to be bundled in to the, the generator that you're building up. So now that we've, um, we've seen the, what I'll call the two different ways of shrinking, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we, that I have experienced with type-directed shrinking. So at Ambiata, we're very heavy users of QuickCheck and property-based testing. And uh, we consider property tests to be just as important as types when it comes to building robust software. And uh, as such, we've come to, uh, over time, to understand the, the limitations. Uh, so let's, let's look at an example, and I'll use that to, to motivate um, these challenges. So here we, we've got some data types, and uh, we've got some combinators, 
So we've got a, a name for an order item and some sort of price uh, line item for the order and an order. And then we want to check this property that, um, that when we total up the cost of, of two orders, that that would be the same as merging the orders and, and totaling up the cost. So how do we write arbitraries for these types? Um, I'm going to skip the shrinking part just for the, the moment. So um, for the, the name, we might want to just generate some, some random names here. For the, the price, we'll just generate some number between 1 and 100. And then for item and order, we're just going to use the implicit resolution to pull a, a generator for, uh, for those types. So if we come back to our property and we try and run it, we get a test failure. Um, and why did it fail? Well, it's not so obvious from this example because we didn't write any shrinkers. Um, so if I show you the merge function, it'll be more obvious that we're in business, so we want to make a, a profit. So anytime there's items which cost more than $50, then we charge a $1 processing fee. So that's why, the, that's why it fails, but the, the test doesn't really give us, uh, the counterexample doesn't really give us much information about why that's the case. So um, let's, uh, let's go and implement this shrink part of the arbitrary type class. Okay, so if we come to, um, to our name example and uh, implement shrink for this, uh, you might think this is a bit, bit over the top, but um, what we've done here is try and make it shrink towards apples. So if it's bananas, then smaller than bananas might be apples or oranges. If it's oranges, then smaller than that would be apples. And the reason why you might want to do that is because if you get a counterexample which only has apples, then perhaps the name of the line item is not really that, not really that interesting. So I think it's, it's good to be able to shrink these kind of lists down even though uh, it might seem superfluous. We move on to the, the price. Um, this one's interesting. There's a, a built-in shrink function for, uh, for integers, so we can use that, but it's going to shrink our integer all the way to zero. So that's not ideal because our invariants here show that we really only want prices between 1 and 100, so we have to make sure we filter out the resulting shrink so that we, we only get um, prices which match the invariants. So that's cool. Um, for item... We can use this thing called generic shrink, which uses GHC generics to sort of automatically provide a shrink function, which will just shrink the subterms. And we can do the same for order. So now, when we come back and run our property, uh, we get a much nicer counterexample. And you can see that it's, it's shrunk to apples, so probably the name doesn't really matter that much. And we see that the price is 51 US dollars. So the fact that it was sort of exactly 51, it tells you something about why it's failing. So I think that's really cool. So what happens if our data generation needs get a bit more complicated? What about if we have two different kinds of items? What if we want to generate some cheap things, sandwiches and noodles? Or if we want to generate some expensive things? And then we want to have this higher order generator where we can generate orders that have either cheap or expensive items. So that's Generators are awesome. We can sort of use applicative and functor and monad to compose them. But um, if we come along to arbitrary, it's a type class, so we need to new type our uh, orders in order to generate, in order to have different um, arbitrary instances for them. So that works great for our, um, for our generators. But how do we implement shrink? So, I mean, we would have to go all the way down into the order and make sure that we, we only shrink and stay within the invariance of the cheap and expensive things. And um, to be honest, I'm not really sure how I'd implement that. It's, uh, it's really pretty challenging, I think. So this is a problem, and um, it has some knock-on effects. So because it's quite tedious, <laughs> uh, some people don't bother to implement shrink functions at all. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. <laughs> because shrinking's not really useful until you need it. And I often find this guy with hundreds of lines of counterexample pasted into his text editor, trying to figure out why a test was failing and sort of shrinking it by hand. Um, but he's not the only one, so we kind of have to, we kind of have to deal with it. 
And in fact, Charles helped me out and we um, downloaded every package on Hackage to find out who's been naughty and nice. And it turns out that only one in six arbitrary instances <laughs> even implement shrink. <laughs> So this is a problem. Another challenge working with arbitraries is uh, writing generators which depend on values. So say we had um, some data types like this and we have a schema which describes some value that you might want to generate. Um, doing the arbitrary for schema is, is pretty easy. Don't worry too much about the scale stuff. Um, so that's similar to what we've seen before. But if we want to then generate a value based on the random schema, then how do we write that as an arbitrary? We can't really take the schema as a parameter to arbitrary or to, to shrink. So I mean, we could, we could just write the generator part and then use for all to sort of explicitly select a generator. Um, but now we've lost the shrinking for values. So that's, that's a shame. Um, and this situation of writing generators that do not have arbitrary instances uh, is, is quite a common one that I have seen in Abiata. Um, so that's a problem as well. Uh, having generators that are selected using this implicit resolution thing where you kind of magically get a random value for your arguments, it, it looks very nice. Uh, but it can have consequences when people aren't aware of what kind of generators they're, they're getting by default. So for example, the arbitrary for int just provides integers in the range minus 100 to 100. Uh, this has caused some issues in Abiata on several occasions. And in fact, just, uh, just last week, there was a bug discovered in the text package. The take end function doesn't work correctly in some situations. And how can this be? They have hundreds of property tests. Now, if we have a look at the test, which actually could have caught this bug, um, it looks something a little bit like this. So, we get a, an integer and a string, and then we implement take end using list combinators. So we reverse, and so then take end, and then reverse again. Um, and then we do the same using the take end function for, for text. So what's the problem here? I'll, I'll give you a hint. Um, what kind of characters does the arbitrary for char generate? It turns out it just generates Latin one characters. Um, which is fine for many cases and probably what you want much of the time, but it's easy to uh, fall into the trap of letting um, the sort of implicit resolution do the dirty work and not actually testing the full range of, of data necessary. So if Brian O'Sullivan can make this mistake, then anyone can. And the, the last problem that I want to talk about is uh, orphan instances. So. It's worth mentioning because we'd like to keep our test code separate from our production code. Um, and so that means that arbitrary is often an orphan instance in practice. And uh, in PureScript, orphan instances are a type error. So this becomes even more problematic, prob problematic in a language like that. So we've seen the challenges that we're we uh, face with type-directed shrinking. Could we ever have integrated shrinking in a statically typed language? Well, uh, I would say that we, we give it a try. So let's talk about a, a possible implementation. We've got our arbitrary type class. <coughs> uh, we could start by making arbitrary a, a data type so we can pass it around and, and write combinators which work on arbitrary. Um, but one of the problems with this is that arbitrary in this situation is an invariant functor. Um, the A appears on both sides in the shrink function, so we've sort of lost the great interface that, that Jen has. Um, one possible solution would be to separate the parameters and make it a, a pro functor. Uh, so now we have uh, this contravariant parameter which is different from the covariant parameter, but the divisible interface isn't quite as nice syntactically to work with as applicative, and doing both at the same time is pretty challenging. So that's not going to work. What if we make it so that the generator also produces the shrink function? It's still invariant, but it's starting to look interesting now, I think. And I want to focus on, on this part here. 
So we've got an A and we have a function which goes from an A to a list of A. Well, the logical thing to do is to just keep, is to just keep applying the function to the value until it returns an empty list. Or put another way, we can use the shrink function to unfold a rose tree. So we'd like to go from our generated value of A in the shrink function to a tree. So a tree down here is uh, an A and then a list of trees. So let's say we want to generate an integer in the range 0 to 10, and the random number generator produces a 5. Um, so that's up here at the top of the tree. We then run the shrink function once, and we get the first level of shrinks for 5. And then we run it again recursively, and we get the rest of the shrink tree. And thanks to Haskell's laziness, we can just do all of this on demand very performantly without really having to think too much about it. We just do the whole unfold up front, and laziness takes care of the rest. So now if we go back to our arbitrary data type, um, we can see that we've made it covariant. So we can fmap this, we can combine it with applicative, and, um, and also with monad. So what is a gen? Until now, we've just sort of seen it as this uh, kind of random value generator that's, that's opaque, but let's have a look inside. We'll see that it's more or less uh, just a function which takes a random seed and produces a value of A. And we might as well push our tree down into here and then we can just get rid of arbitrary altogether. So now we only have gens. And with that, we get shrinking for free. And we can all just be lazy programmers. So um, anytime we combine the generators, we using functor applicative or monad, the rose trees are also combined and we get the compound generators sort of produce compound rose trees. Now because our generators are just a data type, it's easy to build gens which depend on values. So if we go back to the example that we saw in the beginning, um, the gen value is very much just the same as what it was before, and we use for all to, to summon our values, but we also get shrinking here as well, so that's beautiful, and there's no arbitrary instances. Um, because there's no arbitrary instances, we have to make explicit choices about what we're generating. So if we have a look at what um, the, the text property would have looked like in this, um, in this sort of style, uh, you it would be sort of obvious that we're using Latin one characters and maybe we should use Unicode characters instead. Uh, and now if we run, the, run this over text, we get a counter example. So that's good. And no orphans, so Fagan is sad because <laughs> we don't have an arbitrary type class anymore. So early experiments with this rose tree idea um, worked out really well, and uh, we had a little library inside Ambiata that, um, that was quite promising. And uh, so I decided to start the Hedgehog project to try and push this idea as far as possible. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a few Hedgehog features made possible by rose trees and integrated shrinking, which I think are interesting, and a couple of other features which are not really related at all. <laughs> So the first thing that I think is uh, sort of interesting is uh, this range DSL which Hedgehog has. So in, um, in QuickCheck we have gens, and I sort of lied about the type of, of gen initially. Um, I said that it was just a function from seed to A. In actual fact, in QuickCheck, it takes this size parameter as well as uh, random seed. Now, what's the size parameter? This size thing goes from, from zero to up to 99 as the number of tests increase. Um, and the idea is that, I guess, smaller tests probably catch most of the bugs, but it's, it's good to do some large ones, even though they might take a bit longer. Um, and in some, it, it sort of helps shrinking out a little bit as well if your initial examples are smaller. So we have this size thing. If we look at some of the quick check combinators, um, some of them are affected by size and some of them aren't. So choose chooses a random value between, between these two bounds, and that's not affected by the size parameter at all. The list of combinators, they, uh, they are affected by the size. So the, um, 
as the size increases, you'll get larger and larger lists. Um, so what if we wanted to generate a list which has at least two elements? You could generate a number and then pass it to vector of, and uh, that would give you a random sized list, but list shrinking is sort of special and we might break it by doing that. So in, in Hedgehog, we have a slightly different setup. So the Hedgehog combinators are one-to-one -one with types for the most part. And um, they're parameterized by these range things. So what is a range? Well, a range is this data type which has uh, two parameters. We've got an origin, which is the value that we would like to shrink towards. Um, and we have this function which, from a size, gives you the, the bounds of uh, the thing that you're going to generate. And we have a bunch of these combinators for doing different things. So I'll, I'll show you what the combinators do. So a, a singleton produces a range which, um, as the size increases, it, it does nothing. So a singleton 5 is always going to give you the, the bounds 5 to 5. Uh, constant range. Um, so constant 0, 10 is also unaffected by the size parameter. Uh, but So it gives you a range from 0 to 10, but then when it's shrinking, it shrinks towards 0. It shrinks towards the first parameter. If we flipped the, the arguments, then it would shrink towards 10 instead, which is interesting. Constant from, um, it takes three arguments, is unaffected by the size, but it shrinks towards this first argument. So we could say the range is minus 100 to 100 and then shrinking towards zero. Um, now it starts to get interesting. So linear is affected by the size parameter. So if we have this linear range 32 to 1024, as the size increases, the range slowly increases to 1024 to 32, but when we shrink, we always shrink to 32. So this gives you quite a bit of control over how things shrink and how things, um, how the bounds increase as the size increases. And uh, finally, we have linear from. Um, this is sort of a nice way of generating uh, years for a um, for a, a date or something like that. So we start with the year 2000, and then as the size increases, we expand the range of years that we generate to down to 1970 up to 2100. But then when we shrink, we shrink to a nice year like 2000, um, which is a lot nicer than shrinking to zero. This is what it might look like if you're using these combinators. So um, in Hedgehog, there's just one list combinator, and it takes a range to control the size. And then using this range thing, you could sort of implement all of the, the quick check combinators, but if you want something a bit fancier, like you want a, a list between 5 and 10, which sort of increases to be a, um, you know, starts off generating only 5 to 5 and then increases 5 to 10 for the larger tests, you can do that. And then here's our year example. So what about effectful properties? How do we deal with, uh, with these kind of things? So because of Hedgehog's architecture, if we want effectful properties, then we need to have effectful generators. So that means somehow we need to add effects to this, this tree somehow. Um, now it turns out that it's as simple as just adding a monadic effect to the tree. And so now we can have an effect at, at every node. Um, and, and we're done, right? The <laughs> In Hedgehog, all properties are monadic. Um, so the, the for all, you would sort of use it inside your property monad. Um, assert works like it does in monadic quick check. And you can use property to sort of lift a test into a property. So what does this look like? So hedgehog property looks like this. So we can do some effectful thing and then we can generate some stuff and we still get shrinking. So what else can you do with effectful generators? Well. Uh, one example, uh, one of my colleagues, Tim, came up with. Um, so he was trying to test a compiler and he wanted to generate well-typed terms. Um, and so he would like to have a map of the environment where he's got all of the, the terms which match a particular type in this reader. And then he can use that to sort of thread the, thread the map around. Um, and that all works quite nicely. So, uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested to, to see if anyone has other good uses for effectful generators. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it'll pan out. 
So with an effectful tree, it's easy for us to add filtering of generators. So if we look at our gen type, which is simplified, I've taken the size out just for the example, then we, we have this M here. So what we can do is uh, move that up there and add a, a maybe T. And now our tree supports alternative and monad plus. So if we wanted to implement a filter function, which is like such that in quick, che in quick check, <coughs> um, we can do it like so. So M filter will sort of go down all to, to all, um, all the leaves, like all the way down the tree. And anything which doesn't pass this filter predicate uh, won't be part of our shrinks. And if the very top level thing doesn't pass the test, then we get empty. So that means that we want to try the alternative, which is the, this filter thing here. So we basically keep looping and, and um, trying to generate things until we find at least one thing which passes the generator, uh, passes the predicate. Now, uh, in reality, you would probably keep track of how many times you've looped around so you don't loop forever. Uh, so that's, that's kind of neat, I think. Um, another useful thing you might want to do is uh, try and generate something which is really tricky and, and doesn't always work. Um, so an example might be you uh, want to generate an expression which matches a type, but, and so you would like to generate it by using things from the environment, but uh, if you fail, then maybe you just want to generate some easy thing which um, is a constant or something like that. So that's a, a nice way to do that, being able to fail over and, and do something that you know that you can do. So that's sort of uh, all the things which you can do with um, this integrated row string idea. Now I'm just a few little frills on top that you get with Hedgehog. So you get um, source annotations, which means that if you were to run a property like this from our, one of our earlier examples, um, when we get a failure, the, uh, the inputs that we generated for these for alls get uh, kind of annotated in with the source code. So I think that's kind of nice, very uh, pretty output. And uh, I'll talk about this in the next slide. So another thing that we have is when you do equality, you get uh, value diffs. So say we have some sort of complicated record and uh, we do something silly like generate two random records and say they have to be equal to each other, which is obviously false, then uh, you'll get a counterexample a bit like this. So you can see it's um, all the things that are the same are just the same and it's a regular sort of diff situation. And uh, you should note that this is pretty printed using John's pretty printing library. <laughs> So just wrapping up, um, we have seen what shrinking is. We have learned about the difference between, uh, we've learned about type-directed shrinking and the challenges that, uh, that we faced in, in trying to use it. We've seen that programmers are lazy and they don't write shrink functions. So we have looked at another approach, integrated shrinking. We've seen how to implement that and how that gives you shrinking for free. And uh, finally, we've seen some of the things that Hedgehog can, can do on top of that idea. Um, Hedgehog is uh, up on GitHub. The Haskell version is on, is on Hackage now. Uh, there's a sort of earlier um, version of this idea in PureScript on my personal GitHub that I'll pull over to the Hedgehog repo when I get time. And there's sort of an in-progress Scala version up there as well. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.